friends, good morning. And thank you so much for choosing to be here. I was uh, reflecting this morning on the time that I was a young novice. And this was back in late 1997, early 1998. There was a German woman who was a disciple of Thomas Merton who came to visit Plum Village at that time. She spent three weeks with us in Plum Village. And she didn't say much during her stay, but towards the end of her stay, the end of the three weeks, um, she was asked to share how her, her time in Plum Village was. And so she shared her intention for coming to Plum Village at that point. She said, many years ago, she had read the story um, of my teacher visiting Gethsemane Monastery um, down in the south um, in the 60s and addressing the young um, novices in Gethsemane Monastery. It was a Trappist um, center in the south of America, in the southern states. And during the time that he was addressing the, the novices, uh, he opened the door and he closed the door and Thomas Merton was observing how my teacher opened the door and closed the door and said, we can tell that Thich Nhat Hanh is a real monk by the way he brings all of himself to open and close a door. And this, for some reason, made a very strong impression on this German woman. And she said she came to Plum Village with only one intention. That was to see how Thich Nhat Hanh and the monastics open and close the door. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Tay asked her, well, how do you feel after three weeks? And she said, very confident. Uh, <laughs> so she went back to Germany and uh, we haven't seen her since she comes from the Catholic tradition but hopefully she got the door opening and door closing transmission um, in Plum Village we, as we shared last night we take each moment of our life as a practice um, we, in Buddhism in general uh, we want to practice in a holistic way the way we eat, the way we think the way we walk, it's all connected together um, our emotions are connected in as well um, and so we want to have some very concrete tools to help us to be able to go a little bit more deeply in terms of encountering and using our daily life as our practice. As a young novice in Plum Village, we are requested to sign a contract with a piece of um, a path, a section of path or a staircase or a doorway that every time we encounter that that area, we will walk it or, in, or engage with it in mindfulness. And if we don't, we'll stay there until we do. Um, my teacher shared that he signed a contract with his staircase in the hermitage, in his hermitage, because it's a very large staircase. And he uh, made the determination that every time he walked that staircase, he would walk it with every step in mindfulness. And even if he got one step from the top, if he was distracted, he would go back to the bottom and begin again. So each of us was required to um, sign a contract as a novice with something of our choosing. I chose a section of path, that every time I would walk that section of path, I'd walk it with my full attention, not being distracted by anything. And it was very interesting to see how many times I would get almost to the end and have to start again uh, from the beginning of the path. This is, in a sense, a training. We call it meditation practice, and we forget um, that for musicians or artists, um, others, there's, or even for chefs, there's a period of training. You need to learn, if you're a musician, you need to learn the scales. Um, you need to learn the piece of music. And then once you've learned that, once it's become embodied within you, it becomes a practice. Somehow we don't make the connection with our own spiritual life. We think that everything just needs to click right away. And if it doesn't, oh, I must be somehow dysfunctional in terms of meditation. Why is it not working for me? It must be working for everybody else. It's a training and then a practice. If you're a musician, we need to understand the way a piece of music has been written. And we play it exactly as it's been written number of times we need to understand the intention of the composer and then if we stop at that level we will be a fantastic technical musician we'll be able to recreate that piece of music over and over and over again but our career will last only a couple of years because we're doing playback radio style um, we play it exactly the same way all the time 
technically great, but there's something missing. If we're a musician that's um, quite accomplished, we take the next step. We understand the intention of the composer. We understand the situation in which the composer um, created that piece of music. We step into that experience, and then we take another step. We understand where we are, where we are internally, where we are at this moment in time and space, what the situation of those listening to the piece of music we're about to play is. What's the nature of the whole? Is it small? Is it large? Uh, what are the acoustics like? And then based on all of those um, different factors, we make an interpretation. We play the music, uh, the piece of music in a way that's appropriate for that situation, for that moment in time. It's never the same twice. In the same way as meditation practitioners, in our training, it's important to understand uh, the ways things go together, why things are a certain way, and we practice following those um, instructions. And then, that's really great, we're imitating. It's fantastic, it's like every artist, um, we want to imitate something <coughs> and get to understand it. And then, the next step, we need to bring a little bit of ourselves, understand the way that our own particular makeup is, our own strengths, our own challenges, and apply the practice in a way that works for us. This is called the interpretation. We call this in my tradition, a Dharma body. In the beginning stages, we're taking refuge, in a sense, externally, in these, these conditions that we think are external, Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, we consider these things as external factors. And then as our practice takes on a life of its own, we start to recognize these qualities also within. And it's almost as if as we take refuge in the Dharma, in a sense, the Dharma takes refuge in us. It manifests in a unique way through us. Each of us has our own unique um, experiences, makeups, and tendencies. And one size doesn't fit all. So we are invited to consider with the whole of our attention our own unique capacities and capabilities. And don't be afraid to imitate in the beginning, but be also willing to take the next step and allow the Dharma to manifest itself through you. In my own teacher's hermitage, to speak of uh, the hermitage, there's a beautiful calligraphy on the wall that I love so much. I walked past it for many years, and every time I'd walk past it, I would stop and, and look at it. It says, the joy of meditation is daily food. So many of us struggle so much with meditation. We shared last night that we're invited to sit in such a way, to walk in such a way, to eat in such a way that that which we're looking for is available for us here and now. Um, as, as it's shared in the recollection, immediately useful and effective, not 10 years in the future once we get through a whole lot of hard labor, but right here and right now. Our meditation practice can be a delight, can be a source of nourishment in and of itself. For me, I often uh, contemplate that phrase, the joy of meditation is my daily food. And I will never forget many years ago in Plum Village, one of our eldest uh, Dharma sisters, she was having a struggle with her meditation practice. She was finding it really dry, <coughs> and, uh, really difficult. So our teacher said to her, I'm not going to mention her name, but our teacher said to her, you know what you need to do? When we come to the morning and the evening sitting meditation, you need to bring a cup of tea into the meditation hall. You need to sit there and drink a cup of tea and <laughs> let go of all of these ideas about how your meditation needs to be. But just sit there and enjoy a cup of tea. That can be incredibly profound. So she found that so difficult to do um, in the meditation hall. Everybody else is sitting and we have, at that time we had a person walking around to correct everybody's posture. And, we, do, we don't use the stick in Pong Village, but we go around and correct the posture. And funnily enough, the brother who used to do that in our hamlet, um, he, had, uh, always, he had a skin condition, and he always used to use Nivea cream on his hands. And so we would know, we could smell the Nivea cream coming. 
<laughs> All of us as young novices, of course, we were kind of young and tired. We were sitting like this, and we would smell the Nivea cream. And <laughs> so Nivea cream has a particular association <laughs> for, for me. So approaching our meditation practice with that sense of curiosity and delight um, can be a wonderful transformation in our attitude and can help us to be able to be very fresh with, the, with what we're doing. I love a lot of the texts, and I tend to love some of the more obscure texts, um, some of the texts that are less widely encountered. Um, it might just be a quirk of my own personality, but um, uh, I, I, I just find myself drawn to them. There's one text that I really love in, in particular. I, I picked up an old second-hand book at, um, at an old bookstore, antiquarian bookstore in Brisbane, Australia, years ago. This was 1995, I think. Uh, it was called Some Sayings of the Buddha by F.L. Woodward. And it's this tiny little book, and I've kept it all of these years. It's, this, it's in very antiquated language, verily, thou, thys, and untos, throughout it. But um, it has this amazing collection of very obscure little texts from the, the, the canon. One of the texts is from a collection of discourses called the Kudakapada. And um, in there it's, it's basically the, called the questions to a novice. Um, and for me, I also love the backstories to the sutras. Sometimes we read the texts and we think, oh, that's nice. And we don't consider who they were given to or the circumstances. And this particular text is a series of 10 questions, and it was given to a young novice called Sopaka. Sopaka was an orphan who was discarded by his family, and the story goes that after his mother remarried, the stepfather really hated young Sopaka and abandoned him in a charnel ground in the cemetery. And the Buddha came across Sopaka and basically took him in, uh, fed him, took care of this young, traumatized child, and um, really nurtured him and raised him within the Sangha. So these 10 questions were um, the Buddha's way of kind of testing Sopaka's insight after a number of years of practicing with the Sangha. I love the text so much that I wrote a book about it, and uh, I, it just, I think about it very often. The, the first of the questions is, what is the one thing that connects us all? And the answer that Sopaka gave is that all things exist on food. Everything exists on food. So we can read that on many levels. We think of, um, when we think of food, we normally think of edible foods, but there are also other kinds of nutriment. When we're talking about everything, we're talking about, of course, our physical bodies. We're talking also about our happiness, our sadness, our jealousy, our despair, our anger, our peace, it didn't just fall from the sky, but it, it has been nurtured in some way, consciously and most often unconsciously, or sometimes a combination of both. Everything exists on food. As we cultivate mindful attention, as we cultivate this open-hearted awareness to each aspect of our lives, I think it's almost impossible not to begin to see the importance of mindful consumption. To see the relationship between the things we eat, not only with our bodies, but through the other aspects of our being, which we'll get onto through this weekend, and what manifests both physically, emotionally, and spiritually around us. The teaching on nutriment is an incredibly powerful tool for us to be able to look at our situation and make choices that help us to be able to nurture that which we most want to see. We have a saying in Mahayana Buddhism, we are already what we want to become. Now a lot of people think, oh that's great, don't need to do anything, I'm a Buddha. Um, and while in the ultimate dimension that might be correct, um, it, in the sense that there's a part of ourselves that's unobstructed, that's clear that's loving, we call this the Buddha nature. We have a, a seed, might be really tiny, but we all have a seed of uh, goodness in our hearts, so does everyone else. But also the flip side of that is that we are already what we have wanted to become. We have made choices, 
go through the things we eat, the things we encounter in daily life, the kind of environment that we choose to be in, um, that have contributed to the situation we're in right now. So the teaching of the Four Nutriments is a very concrete teaching of the Buddha to help us to look at our situation holistically. I feel it's incredibly fundamental. Last year, um, as I was sharing, I think with Group 2 last night, um, as Group 1 was having a tour, uh, I was asked last year to give a series of four teachings for Tricycle Online. And I considered what to offer, and I looked at what other teachers were offering. And I realized as I looked around the quite vast and intricate, perhaps Byzantine Buddhist landscape in North America, that nobody was teaching on the Four Nutriments. And it is, in the Plum Village tradition, one of our core teachings. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to offer this teaching. So I offered a series of four teachings. I was a little bit hesitant, to be honest, although I had this motivation and this wish to offer it, because I feel it is incredibly powerful and useful, and we can apply it immediately. But it's new material for a lot of practitioners, and it's kind of confronting for some people as well, due to the graphic imagery that the Buddha used. However, I offered these teachings, and it seemed like people really um, benefited from them because it was material that was immediately able to be applied. So the teaching of the Four Nutriments can empower us to make choices that make sense for us. In the Buddha's teaching, in the, the canon, there are so many different teachings and practices. And in my own Mahayana tradition, we have these paradoxical vows. We say uh, one of the vows is Dharma doors or practices are unlimited. They're uncountable. I will master all of them. So when I reflect on that myself, I think, goodness, we have trouble following our breathing. How are we going to master all of them? all the practices that are there. Um, in the, in the texts, uh, the fundamental text, the Buddha offered 40 different kinds of meditation. In the Mahayana text, it said 84,000 different Dharma doors or practices. How are we going to master them all? So, I'm comfortable with paradox. I find it's interesting and I find my mind wants to swing to either way or another. I'm going to master them all, okay, everything contains the one, or just focus on uh, the limitless thing, oh, I can never do it. You know, I go from one extreme to another, overconfidence to, to despair. <laughs> <laughs> it's very humbling like that, a vow. And our minds are very intricate uh, uh, things. And not so long ago, I was walking into our meditation hall, the Ocean of Peace meditation hall in Deer Park. I walked into the meditation hall and I was sitting there for preparing for our sitting meditation. In our meditation hall in Deer Park, we have 12 doors, so it's not 84,000, there are 12, uh, which is a little more manageable. And I noticed that friends were walking through any number of the doors, uh, whichever one seemed appropriate to them, and they came in and they sat down. And at that moment in time, we were all sharing the same space. We were all in the meditation hall, sharing the same conditions. At that point, it became immaterial as to which door we entered. What mattered was we were in the space sharing it. So in one way, by entering one door, we enter all of them. We only need to practice one thing and to practice it deeply, really deeply and fully, one simple thing, and that can be enough. You know, this day and age, we have so many Dharma teachings. We can go online and have Insight Timer, we have Headspace, we have Dharma Seed, all, like so many different opportunities to listen to podcasts, get books, watch video teachings on YouTube or Facebook Live. Uh, <laughs> hi to everyone who's watching it uh, wherever you are uh, we have so many opportunities to encounter teachings a wealth of teachings there's never been a time in which we can encounter Dharma in the, the rich way we can in this day and age 
Our challenge is to put one thing into practice. In the old days, some, uh, sometimes a practitioner would travel a very long way to meet with a teacher. And at least in the Zen tradition, I can't speak much for the Theravadan tradition, but in the Zen tradition, they would travel a long way and um, they would ask a teacher a question. They'd have one opportunity to ask a question. And maybe they'd ask something like, what's the essence of the Buddha Dhamma? And the teacher would say, go and look at the cypress tree out the front. This is Master Jiao Jiao. Go and look at the cypress tree out the front. And that was the teaching that they received. That was it. Um, that's what they had to practice with. In our own tradition, before we uh, encounter a sutra, a teaching of the Buddha, which we don't consider in my lineage to be only a teaching that's being given 2,600 years ago, we consider it a teaching that is alive right here and right now, and that's being given to us right here and right now, in a sense. Because each time we encounter it, we're a new person, and we receive it differently each time. We recite in our mind a verse, the Dhamma is deep and lovely. I or we now have a chance to see it, to hear it, to study it, and the most difficult, to actually put it into practice. I vow to realize its true meaning. So what does it mean to see the Dhamma? What does it mean to hear the Dhamma? What does it mean to study it? And what does it mean to put it into practice? The most important of those phrases is what? Put it into practice. This is our invitation and challenge at this moment in time. <coughs> a couple of um, uh, weeks ago, I went to the optometrist and I had an eye test and I was given a new set of prescriptions and I, I put on those glasses and I just went, wow, I could see everything in such a clear way. I didn't realize how blurred things were until I put on those glasses. It was an amazing experience to see things through those new lenses. <clears throat> Each one of the Buddha's teachings is a lens through which we can, if we put it into practice, experience the world, experience the world of our own mind with new lenses. Each one of the practices is an opportunity to see things in a new way. <clears throat> And some of the teachings are going to be more appropriate to some of us than, than others. So when we put on the, this lens, this weekend of the Four Nutriments, it's one way to look at our condition. And I think it's an incredibly, as I've said, powerful way to be able to look at our condition. So through one lens, in a sense, <coughs> an ultimate sense, we master all of the practices, all of the Dharma doors, because we're entering the space of the practice. Why don't we enjoy the sound of the bell? In the Samyutta Nikaya, in the Pali Canon, and in the Samyutta Agama, in the Taisho Chutipaka, the Mahayana Canon, <clears throat> there's a sutra called the Discourse on the Sun's Flesh, or the Discourse on the Four Kinds of Nutrients. We have this in our chanting book in Plum Village. Um, we have a, a small chanting book that has some key texts that are really important to the Plum Village tradition. And many of them are, are things that are quite familiar to a number of us, like uh, the Discourse on Love, the Metta Sutta, um, the Discord, the Mahamangala Sutta, um, different suttas like that, and some from the Mahayana tradition as well. This one occupies pride of place. And our teacher offers these teachings on the Four Nutriments in many public retreats that he offers. So it was a surprise to me stepping out um, of a village and stepping out of the monastic setting to realize that many people haven't encountered it. The first time I encountered this teaching, I was shocked to my core. I literally was taken aback at the graphic imagery in this sutra. And I'm a kind of person that when I have a strong reaction to something, 
I get curious. I want to understand why did I have that reaction, and what what is it about this text that's really rubbing me in this way, or this teaching that's rubbing me in this way? I think I always want to expand the envelope, the edge of my practice. And I feel that the Buddha offered such graphic imagery in this sutra because he wanted to underline the importance of the nutriments. When we talk about things like the Four Noble Truths, for some of us, these are, I mean, this is an essential teaching of Buddhism, the Four Noble Truths. But then how do I apply that in my daily life to this situation? The Four Nutriments is a very concrete way to be able to apply the, the Four Noble Truths. What is the cause of my current situation, whether it's a, a difficult situation or a joyful situation? What's the root of that? And so on. We need to understand the connection between what we consume, as we shared earlier, and what manifests physically, emotionally, and spiritually within us. What do we experience in this moment? Are we experiencing something that we call happiness, peace, Jealousy, despair, anxiety, what do we name it? So let's take a moment to just connect in with what we're experiencing it. And how do we experience it in our body? What does it feel like? In the discourse on the sun's flesh, the Buddha outlines four kinds of nutriment. And they go from a kind of gross, a very easily um, encountered form of nutriment to more and more subtle layers of nutriment. And they're all connected together. So as we go through this teaching, some of it will come together as we have our talk tomorrow. Because when we understand the subtle layers, we'll understand the, the more coarse layers of nutriment but it's easier to approach the teaching through the coarser layers of nutriment. They're easier to focus on. So the first of the four nutriments is called edible food. This is not difficult to understand. Uh, it's the kind of food that we put in our mouth, although let's be honest, it can be argued that some of the things we put in our mouth are not really <laughs> edible foods. Uh, <laughs> So edible food, the things we put in our mouth. We spoke last night about eating meditation and becoming aware of the sources of our food. Becoming cognizant of when we call something or recognize something as a carrot. What does it contain? If we look deeply into a carrot, it can contain many things. It contains the sunlight, it contains the water, it contains the minerals from the earth and so on and so on. The labors of the farm workers. Um, the carrot contains minerals. All the conditions. In Plum Village, we have a sign in the dining hall, another calligraphy that says, the bread in your hand is the body of the cosmos. So as a contemplation, looking into one piece of food, what does it not contain? Take out the sunlight from the carrot. It's not gonna be a carrot anymore. It can't exist. Take out water. It can't exist. So it contains so many different conditions that have come together in a form that we currently call carrot. It also contains a lot of suffering as well. Perhaps it's also traveled very, very far. When we look at edible foods, we have to be honest with ourselves and um, recognize that many of us are not aware of the sources of our food. Where did this food come from? What does it contain? How much water does it contain? Um, are there people that are enslaved who are um, creating this food? Chocolate slavery, for example, amongst many. Um, what's the carbon footprint of this food? How many, what's the, the suffering of the animals that have um, contributed to this, this food? Uh, so many of us who are meat eaters, don't contemplate the source of our food and the, our, the meat that we eat. I'm not saying vegetarian food doesn't create suffering, uh, doesn't contain suffering because it does. But also meat contains suffering as well. The animals are not in a state of, usually in a state of peace and ease when they're slaughtered for food. 
if we contemplate the source of the meat, it can we realize that it uh, on a very visceral level that it can also contain a lot of fear, anger, um, despair. And this can be true too for some vegetarian food. So if we're vegetarian, we need not feel proud. Um, some of us who are vegans, um, and in Palm Village we are vegan, uh, we can think, oh, we're great, we have such little impact on the earth, no, 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 we feel really good about ourselves. But then we're flying, we're, we're getting food uh, from Asia, we're getting food from all over. Um, we don't consider the condition of the farm workers, um, all of these things. So we need to look with open eyes at the sources of our food. When we ingest foods that contain a lot of suffering, that becomes, that enters into us in some way, even if we try to just blank it out and ignore it. Um, as many of us do, we just, um, people say, oh, I don't want to think about where um, my meat comes from or where the food is traveled from and things. I just want to eat. Okay, that's where we're at. But we ingest those energies in some way because they're, they're part of the food. There's a continuation in that. So as we become aware of edible foods, we, we look at the source of the food. We look at what it contains, the joys, the whole universe, including suffering. And in a sense, it's a very humbling experience. There was a time in Carl Jung's psychological development that he used to ask his clients, before they would tell him anything about the situation, he would ask them what they were doing just before they came to the office. And then they would share a vignette of their life. Maybe they were going to buy a dress or something. <laughs> he would ask them a few questions about how it was to go and buy a dress. And he was able to unwrap a whole course of suffering from that one little vignette. With eating meditation and uh, developing awareness of the sources of our food, we can understand a lot of our situation. <coughs> how does this food feel in my body? Am I just eating for taste? Or am I eating to nurture myself? What are some of the choices that I can make for my body and for my society that can be a way to really nurture myself? What are my fears around food? There are people who don't like, don't like food to touch. Uh, this is a thing. People, um, like they have food separate on a plate and if the food touches, that's, they just can't eat it anymore. All these, these kind of things. And we all have our quirks around, around food. So being on retreat and in our daily life, it can be a really wonderful experience to recognize all of these tendencies we have around edible food. When we look in the sutra, the Buddha gave a very graphic image a very painful image, particularly in our day and age. There's the image of a couple who's traveling through a wilderness, through a desert. Um, I often picture a refugee family at this moment in time. It could easily be a refugee family. There are many thousands, perhaps millions of refugee families at this moment in time trying to get somewhere where it's safe. So this family has left uh, a situation of great despair and they're traveling through a desert and they still have many, many days to travel. They've run out of food and water, perhaps many days in the past. They're carrying their only son, perhaps a young toddler or a baby, on their back. And they're desperately hungry, desperately thirsty. And they know that um, they're not going to make it. And so the, the partners, the husband and wife, as it's written in the sutra, start to have a heartbreaking discussion. And they, they say to each other, what are we going to do? How are we going to survive? All three of us are going to die if we don't figure out something. And so it doesn't say in the sutra who came up with the idea, but this heartbreaking idea is, is expressed Perhaps our only way out is to kill our only child and to eat the flesh of our child. And in that way, at least two of us will survive. And so we can just imagine, this is their first born child, their only child. And we can imagine the mind state, the frenzied, uh, 
despaired mind state of the parents. Um, it's so hard for us, even though we can imagine and empathize with it, to, to even process that somebody could come to such a decision. But they did. And then um, it says in the sutra they, they ate the flesh of their child with so much uh, wailing and crying and, and beating of their breasts and they made their way through the desert um, to safety. And the Buddha said, do you think they enjoyed eating the flesh of their child? And the monk said, of course not. Of course they didn't. I mean, we ourselves can imagine that even when they got to safety, this tragedy would have scarred them for the rest of their lives. Such a, a visceral thing. So the Buddha said, in the same way we need to relate to edible foods, as if when we eat edible foods, we need to eat them as if we're eating the flesh of our own child. So here we think of things like the impact on the earth. We think of things like the impact on those who are creating the food in very difficult situations. We think of those who are disenfranchised. We think of the larger impact of the decisions that we make. Perhaps it means to choose to eat a little bit more simply. Perhaps it also is an invitation for us to consider the own child of our own body. When we think of our children, we think of them as uh, entities somehow separate from ourselves. But our children um, are present in every cell of our body right now. So when if we make unwise choices that damage our own bodies, our physical bodies, in a sense, we are also damaging uh, the bodies of our descendants, our children. So choosing to nurture ourselves in this way, making good choices in terms of edible foods, is also nurturing our descendants, whether they're physical descendants or um, what we call in our tradition continuation bodies. We all have different transformation bodies. There's the you that's sitting here right now, there's the you in the mind of your family, there's the you in the mind of your co-workers, there's the you in the mind of your friends, um, and all of these are different aspects of yourself that people are in contact with. So edible foods are a very concrete way for us to see how we interact with nutriment in our daily life. Why don't we enjoy a sound of the bell? The second kind of nutriment is something that we call in English sense impressions. It's a, a translation of the Pali term, and literally it means, it's basically the kind of foods we take in with our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our body, and our mind. In Buddhism, we consider there are, uh, the mind is also a sense, because without consciousness, like we can't interact, our, our senses, the other senses don't work. So our mind is also considered to be a sense base. Sense impressions are the things we see, the things we hear, the things we smell. Um, and it basically means, when we're talking about sense impressions, we're talking about the food of contact. If our eyes are not in contact with um, a sight, then there's not an impression that's made. There's our eye, there's an object, and hopefully there's consciousness there. So then we see something. Or there's our ears, there's a sound, there are sound waves, and then there's consciousness associated with our ear, we call ear consciousness. And then there's what we call a sound. If one of those conditions is missing, then it doesn't come together. So, 
when we uh, speak about the touch we're talking uh, or contact, we're talking about the contact between a sense base like our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our body, and our brain, the sense base, and the consciousness that's associated with it, and an object, okay, a, what we call a sound, a taste, a touch, a smell, or thought. Thoughts just don't arise out of nowhere. They come from a stimulus. So we'll talk about that later. Um, if some of us really want to get technical, and I know some of us do, um, then we call these different aspects the 18 realms of being. It's a very technical term. Because there are six sense bases <coughs> The six uh, bases that we just spoke about, our body, our tongue, our eyes, and so on. There's a consciousness associated with each of them. Eye consciousness, ear consciousness, nose consciousness, tongue consciousness, etc. Um, and some are stronger in some of us, and some are weaker in some of us. We all have our tendencies. Some of us are visual people. Some of us are auditory people. Some of us are kinesthetic, um, to use a... Uh, the psychological uh, framework. And then there is consciousness associated, as I shared. There is then uh, an object. So there's a stimulus that meets that. For um, an ear, as we used before, it is a sound wave. That's the, the object. Or for um, our tongue, it's a taste, etc. So there are 18 realms of being. Uh, that's how we, we break it down. Buddhism is very big on lists. There are lists on everything. There's five of this, there's uh, 250 of that. There's, it's because Buddhism is basically, was for many years an oral tradition primarily, and in some lineages it still is primarily an oral tradition, so it's a mnemonic device. I mean, even in the, the root text that I spoke about earlier, the questions to a novice, it's very much an oral transmission. What are the one? All things exist on food. What are the two? Mind and body. What are the three? Etc. Etc. So that's how we, we learn Buddhism. We, we don't need to get caught too much. Sense impressions live on within us. Um, if you're an advertiser or you're in marketing, you know this very well. Um, sense impressions live on. When we have a, uh, a smell that we encounter or a taste that we encounter, we don't only just encounter that taste or that smell or that touch, we also are give, uh, what's happening within us is that's giving rise to all of the associations that come along with that from our lived experience or the experience of our families or our genetic predispositions. Um, for example, my grandmother used to make fruit cake. Um, she was a cake decorator. And over the years, her whole house became impregnated with the smell of fruit cake. So whenever <laughs> you don't like fruit cake, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. No, I, <laughs> I didn't like it much as a child either. Uh, but uh, we would walk into her house and we would be bombarded with the, the fragrance of fruit cake. These are the kind of cakes that age for many months in the, the cabinet. I think uh, they're infused with alcohol so that they age like that. So it was a very strong and, um, and uh, visceral smell. Nowadays, whenever I smell that smell or, um, or taste something that's similar to a fruitcake, immediately I'm transported back to my grandmother's house and all of the associations with that. Now for you, it could be a taste from many people Foods, uh, edible foods, are one of the ways that we really feel at home. We have this comfort food kind of thing. But also with sense impressions, although it's much more subtle, we're having associations one way or another, whether they're associations of comfort and ease or associations that are more challenging in every moment. In every single moment, there are a multitude of stimuli that are coming in. In the sutra, the Buddha gives a very another visceral image. He gives the image of a cow with no skin. 
that is, has no protection from the insects. And we know that if we have um, been in an environment where there are a lot of flies, I'm from Australia, and they always say that this is the Australian wave, because we're waving away flies and things, then um, the flies will come and settle on your skin. And even with skin, it feels um, very irritating. Like you kind of just kind of want to get them off. And so you see this thing in Australia quite a lot, people waving the flies away. <laughs> Um, and so we have this image of a cow with no skin. So many of us feel like cows with no skin. We feel uh, so exhausted at the end of the day, or sometimes through the whole day. It's so, there's been so much input uh, throughout the whole day or throughout months, throughout years. And this is part of the reason why it's so difficult for some friends in a retreat environment because we're so used to be overstimulated all the time. All of our senses are being bombarded. Some of us find that a really great thing for the short or the medium term. Um, and then at a certain point, it just we get to our saturation limit. Knowing what we've just heard about the associations with each <coughs> impression that's made whether it's a sound or um, a taste. If I give you the image of, I don't know, did they have blackboards here in uh, America when everyone was in elementary school? There was always a joker in a class, in all of the classes I was in in Australia who would go <coughs> down a blackboard. Right, yeah, there you go. There's the association right there. Right there. So um, just bringing that to mind, it's a visceral uh, experience, isn't it? We feel it in our body. There are some people who don't mind it as well. Again, because of the individual nature of the way that our mind works, the people who were doing it didn't. <laughs> so as we get more cognizant of sense impressions, as we start to bring awareness in our daily life, and this retreat is an ideal opportunity to do that, start to notice the things that we see. I see a person in front of me, I see a person smiling, I see flowers, I see a Buddha image, um, I see a carrot, I use that example, or I'm hearing this, I'm hearing that. And we start to also recognize the responses that we have to them, whether it's a pleasant response, oh, I remember my grandmother's house, you know, and I remember um, she did this, she did that, it's a pleasant association. or. It just is what it is. Um, in the beginning stages, a lot of things seem to be like neutral. Or it's something that is unpleasant. Then we start to get a little bit more cognizant of the inner landscape that we're dealing with conscious, uh, like constantly on an unconscious level. Most of us are not aware of these things that are going on all the time. And so for me, I find it really important in a retreat setting to slow things down and to become aware of these sensory impressions. So that when, and, and recognize our, our reactions to them, so that when we come out of the retreat center, we begin to be able to make choices that create an environment around us that's conducive to what we want to manifest. We shared earlier what is it we are already what we want to become. So what is it that you would like to become? We'll speak a little bit more um, about motivation tomorrow because it's the third form of nutriment, but this is an important question. Why are we a practitioner? Why do we meditate? If we have a response to that, maybe not <coughs> the answer, but even a response to that, then it becomes quite easy and delightful to make choices that make sense for us. For example, if we know that at this moment in time, watching uh, CNN all the time is not nurturing peace and joy <laughs> in us, that we're feeling overwhelmed and torn into a thousand pieces, nothing against CNN, I'm just, I use it because it's a, it's a cable news channel, then um, we know what we need to do. Now this can be challenging as well because let's face it, some of us know what we need to do but 
um, it's a little bit like licking honey off a razor blade. We know the razor blade is there, but the honey is really sweet. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, we need to be a little bit compassionate towards ourselves. It's okay. Um, we know that maybe we're not like perfect at this moment in time. We're works in progress, and it's okay. The simple fact that we're willing to bring some awareness to an area of our life, that is something to celebrate. And I feel that being real with where we are, that's the most important thing. Not trying to pretend to be something. So it's okay if at this moment in time we recognize, you know what? Cable news is going to make me feel upset, but I want to feel upset. That's okay. It's the first stage. Recognizing. And then over time we start to, to feel like, well, every time I feel like that, I just get completely burned out. I want to punch a wall. Um, or I want to go and eat a pint of ice cream. Uh, you know, these kind of things. I feel like I'm just, the whole of the West Coast is about to be hit by a nuclear bomb. Um, all these, these kind of uh, associations go through us. And then we, we ask ourselves, why am I doing this to myself? Why am I doing this? And then, if we're an intelligent person, which we all are, we start to say, well, you know what? It's okay, I'm going to make a different choice this time. In the technical term, we call this renunciation, which sounds like a really heavy and big thing. But basically, it's simply, you know, simply understanding that this is old and played out. This is being done a thousand times, same result, and so I'm going to try something new. So we create an environment around ourselves that's conducive. I encourage all of my friends to consider a technological sabbatical for at least one hour a week. Uh, that's doable. For, that's really doable. Don't look at me like it's not doable. <laughs> it's doable. Just turn off your mobile devices for an hour. And, yeah, just notice how things slow down. We have this, they call it FOMO. Uh, <laughs> there are different kind of FOMOs. <laughs> Fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. We'll be okay for an hour. And slow things down. Recognize what's there. And know also that it's challenging. In one of the most important sutras in the Mahayana tradition, I'm a bit of a sutra nerd, I'm just going to come out and say it. Um, in one of the most important sutras in the Mahayana tradition, again, an overlooked one, it was the second sutra ever translated into Chinese. Um, funnily enough, by an Iranian monk. We had... We have to thank um, our friends in the Middle East for the preservation of Buddhism. In the Silk Road Buddhism, they made so much of a contribution. This monk's name was Antikao, Anshikao. He was from Iran, and he translated this discourse called the, the Sutra of the Eight Realizations of Great Beings, second sutra into Chinese. The first one was the Sutra of 42 chapters. Um, in this sutra, there's one line that I love so much, and it's so appropriate right now. That is, our mind is always searching outside of itself, and in that way can never feel fulfilled. We're always looking for the next thing, whatever that next thing is. The thing that's going to fix us or make it all better. And you know what? The Buddha's teaching is that it's not going to make it better. Maybe for a little moment in time there'll be this temporary relief, but the heart of the Buddha's teaching is, you know what? Don't seek small comforts. Speak, seek the real comfort. Go for what's really going to be lasting. And it's not these little things like just one little splash of soy sauce. Oh, we we'll just make this dish hot. Or <laughs> one more cup of coffee. Or Giovanna won't let us have any creamer in our coffee. How am I going to have some water? What am I going to do if I could just have a little splash of anything, really, even if it was almond milk? It would be okay. you know, all of these small comforts. That's where we are. And so our mind is always searching outside, and we are hardwired in that way. So let's be a little bit compassionate, or a lot compassionate. Let's accept all parts of ourselves because we want to bring all parts of ourselves to the practice. Our practice is not a practice of transcendence, it's a practice of transformation. We've grown up with the idea of holiness as being walking on clouds and harps and um, all of these kind of things. Holiness in our day and age means being real with the whole of our being, being a real human being and choosing to transform 
not to transcend. This is the heart of Buddhist practice. We cannot get rid of something, our anger, our jealousy, our sadness, but we can choose to transform it into wisdom. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. But in terms of our mind searching outside of itself and being a little bit humble, I was delighted um, to come across a series of 11 studies, psychological studies that were done um, and released in 2014. Um, so I'm just going to read a couple of excerpts because it might, some of us might relate to this. Um, so it says, most people are, are just not comfortable in their own heads. That's coming as a shock. I mean, isn't it? <laughs> According to a new psychological investigation led by the University of Virginia, the investigation found that most would rather be doing something, possibly even hurting themselves, than doing nothing or just sitting alone with their thoughts. <coughs> In a series of 11 studies at the University of Virginia, it was found that study participants from a wide range of ages, from 18 to 77, so it's a pretty wide range of age, did not generally enjoy spending even brief periods of time alone in a room with nothing to do but to think, ponder, or daydream. I would say having nothing to do is meditation, to think, to ponder, and to daydream, that's up for question, but um, pretty much where this they're describing in the first part of that phrase, meditation. Some even prefer to give themselves electric shocks. <laughs> I hope there's none of those friends here. <laughs> the period of time, this is the interesting thing, the period of time that Wilson, Wilson and his colleagues asked participants to be alone with their thoughts ranged from 6 to 15 minutes. Right. Six to 15 minutes. Basically, they were simply asked to sit in a room on a chair um, without their devices. And there was just a blank room, that's all. So six to 15 minutes. Uh, he does not necessarily attribute the difficulty that people had with this to the fast pace of modern society or the prevalence of readily available electronic devices such as smartphones. Instead, he thinks the devices might be a response to people's desire to always have something to do, refer back to the sutra. There we go. <laughs> um, there's a whole lot of things here which I won't read. The researchers took their studies further after recognizing people's difficulties. Because most people prefer to have something to do rather than just think, he then, they were then asked, would you rather do an unpleasant activity than no activity at all? The results show that many would. Participants would, uh, were given the same circumstances as most of the previous studies, the blank room, the chair, um, but with the added option of administering an electric shock to themselves by pressing a button. 12 of 18 men in the study gave themselves at least one electric <laughs> shock during the 15-minute thinking period. <laughs> By comparison, 6 of 24 females shocked themselves. <laughs> now, don't feel proud. <laughs> it, it does say something about the way that uh, uh, brains are, are wired, but... <laughs> Probably the range of men women in this room. And interestingly, all of the participants had received a sample of the shock prior to the, the experience and reported prior to the experience that they would pay to avoid being shocked again. <laughs> but within that six to fifteen minutes, they had reversed their uh, position and decided to give themselves a shock just to have something to do. <laughs> so in summary, <clears throat> the mind is designed to engage with the world. Even when we're by ourselves, our focus is usually, habitually, on the, what we consider to be the outside world. And without training in meditation, which are difficult for many, most people would prefer their innate preference is to engage in external activities. So as meditators, I like to think that we have a different preference, or we're creating a different scenario. Um, our mind is, in a sense, hardwired, as we just shared earlier, because of consciousness, sense bases, and stimuli, to engage with the outside world. But in the way of looking of Buddhist meditation, there's no such thing as an outside world. The world 
particularly in the Vijnanavada school of Buddhism that I belong to, it's said that the world doesn't exist independently of our mind in the way that we relate to it. So let's use a simple example to conclude our sharing this morning. All of us are sharing the same space, right? We used even the example of the meditation hall before, but we're in the meditation hall right now. All of us are, um, we all have similar cushions. Um, we're in the same um, time zone, pro hopefully. Well, Brother Yasha and myself are still probably in the Midwest, <laughs> time zone-wise, but we're pretty much physically in the same time zone. We're sharing similar conditions. So there's that commonality, there's that universality of this moment. But there's also a very individual world that we're all in right now. If, when we come out of this talk, if we were engaged, if we were not engaged in noble silence, then each of us will have heard different things. Different things will have struck us or, or annoyed us, hopefully not, but uh, annoyed us during this talk or made sense to us or confused us. Um, different things will have seemed important um, to one or another of us. Some of us are feeling warm. I love this example. Some of us are in um, shorts and t-shirts. Others of us are in many layers, particularly if we're from warm countries and we're thin-blooded, like myself. Um, we're in many layers. Um, some of us are feeling very peaceful. Some of us might be feeling agitated. So some of us are thinking, this is such a noisy environment. There's planes flying over all the time. There's bootless radios and cars going past all the time. Others are thinking, this is the most peaceful and quiet environment I've been in for a very long time. Who's right and who's wrong? Whose universe is the ultimate reality universe among all of us? Each one of us is aware of different things in this moment. So when we talk about an outside world, I think we need to be quite humble with what we consider to be an outside world. Many of us consider our view of what reality is to be the truth. And it is true in a sense because it's true for us with the way that our particular mind works and our own tendencies, but it's not true for everyone. So there's a collective reality that we all share, hopefully, and there's also an individual nature. So as we go through today, I think I should mention that I normally offer these teachings over a course of about five days. So it's a lot to, to encounter. I encourage you to bring some gentle and lighthearted awareness to our food as we eat today. Consider where, I actually don't know what we're having for lunch, so it may not be carrots, but I'm just carrots. <laughs> but just, just uh, become aware of what the carrot is and what it contains. Um, whatever the, the dish is in front of us, what it contains. We consider the person or people who cooked it, the sources where it, uh, where it traveled to come here, the happiness that it contains, all the conditions, and also the, the suffering as well. And as we move through the day, we might become aware of just one or two or three sense impressions and what happens within us. If we might approach it from a number of ways. Perhaps we notice that we're feeling peaceful at a moment in time. And then we reflect that, when did this uh, feeling of peace arise? When did it start? And we might realize, oh, I smelled the smell of uh, uh, roast hip tea or something, and that really, it nurtured that in me. Or uh, we might be feeling anxious, and then we start to, to reflect back and, and consider, when did that begin? And we might notice that we came into contact with a sense impression that touched that a little. Um, we might only notice one or two things. Perhaps we just notice things that we see today or things that we hear. Again, knowing that some of us are auditory or visual, kinesthetic. Focus on what makes sense to you. <coughs> this can be a way to begin to develop um, an awareness of um, the landscape that we're working with constantly, internally. So I wish you every success. I want to thank you so much for your attention, and I hope that the talk this morning has been helpful. And I hope you have a delicious rest of the day. Um, let our practice be delightful and delicious. Thank you for being here. Let's finish with the sound of the